The Vape Passion Show, episode 67. In this episode, we're going to talk about why coil builders should buy beetle on spool tamers, vape drama on YouTube, Jay Hayes hates Mike Vapes, Icon RDA, Austrian toxicologist says vaping's bad rep is a public health scandal, Charlie Noble releases their recipe for Commodore Perry, Duncan Hunter's bill to save vaping introduced and listed as HR 2194, a summary of the vaping documentary Billion Lives, and a poem about vaping. Hey, welcome back to the Bay Passion Show. This is episode 67. I'm recording this on Sunday, April 30th. So first I want to provide an update on my email newsletter. Usually my newsletter is just an update of any new posts I put up on my website over the past week. It's a once per week email that goes out on Thursday mornings. It's useful if you want notifications for any new blog posts or videos I've done. Well, I also wanted to add more value to my email subscribers, so last week I tested out adding a new vape deal section. It's basically a list of deals that I've been collecting over the last week, separated out by categories like e-juice, devices, atomizers, and store-wide deals. I want to be transparent and point out that most of these links are affiliate links, which means I'll, I'll get a commission if you buy from them. It doesn't cost you anything extra, and you don't have to use my links if you don't want to, but I'd certainly appreciate it if you think the content that I produce is useful to you. So if you're already a subscriber to my newsletter, keep an eye out for that uh, if it sounds useful to you. And if you're not a subscriber, uh, go to su go subscribe. You'll find the sign up form on my website at vapepassion.com and in the right sidebar. Now, like I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I'm unsure if I'll be able to keep this vlog slash podcast going once I start school. Since I've announced that, I've actually received quite a few emails and comments from people who have mentioned that they really like the show and want me to keep going. Uh, it's really awesome to get comments like that. When I first started the show, the quality was rough. And it still is in my opinion, but it gets better with each episode. Um, but in the beginning, I got a lot of negative comments about the jump cuts and my voice being too boring and monotone. It was really disheartening, but I decided to keep going and, I, and I'm really glad I did. Now, I don't have a big following like some of the other reviewers out there, but that's okay. Just knowing that I'm at least a little interesting to some people is enough for me. So I'm even more motivated now to keep the show going, and I want to thank everyone for their positive emails and comments. Now, I'm not promised anything yet, but I'm going to try hard to keep going, even if it's less than once per week. Anyway, I start school on May 8th, so you'll probably hear more about that in the following weeks. As for any new products, I didn't really get much, but I got some Beetle on Spool Tamers in this week. So let's take a quick look at them. These are basically adjustable elastic bands that go around wire spools to prevent wire from unwrapping. These were originally designed for crafters who use metal wire, but they work just the same for our purposes. If you build your own coils and have spools of wire laying around, you probably know how much of a pain it is when the spool unravels and wire goes flying all over the place. So these spool tamers prevent that from happening. You just put the end of the wire through the little hole on the spool tamer, wrap the band around the spool, and you can dispense wire as needed without having to worry about the wire unraveling. There's only two cons that I can think of with these. The first con being that the elastic material feels like it's a little old. It might only be the batch that I got, but if you're familiar with old elastic, it eventually starts to break apart. Now, I don't know if that will happen to me, but it's possible. I just thought it was something worth mentioning. The second con is that they don't fit well on tiny spools. And that makes sense, though. They aren't going to fit on everything. Uh, most people don't buy tiny spools of wire, so it shouldn't really be an issue for most people. They still work, though. I put them on my tiny spools, and they work. They just don't fit perfectly into the spool. Anyway, these are awesome, and I wish I would have ordered them a long time ago. You can get a pack of 25 from Amazon for only $15, which I think is a good price. All right, the next topic here, vape drama on YouTube. So Jay Hayes hates on Mike Vape's Icon RDA. On ST Vape's YouTube channel, The True Vapor Show, number 91, Mike Vapes was a guest. At about the 22 minute 10 second mark, ST Vapes mentioned that there was a reviewer who gave the Icon RDA a bad review. Mike Vapes, who helped design the Icon RDA with Vandy Vapes, told the story. So they didn't name the reviewer because they didn't want to give him any publicity, but I did some digging around and I figured it out. And, and in case you're wondering, it's Jay Hayes, who's a fairly popular reviewer on YouTube and also the owner of vapelife.com, life spelled with a one. Mike mentioned that he actually asked Jay to review the icon before it was launched. And then Vandy Vape decided that they wanted to send the sample version to certain reviewers first, then the retail version to other reviewers. Vandy Vapes moved Jay to the retail version list, which meant he wouldn't get an early version. This made Jay mad, and he started calling all of the other reviewers has-beens and nobodies, and that he should have been the one to review it. Jay flipped out, he went out and bought one himself, and did everything he could to bash it. Now that's Mike's story. I'm just repeating what he said. Now I watched this review, and Jay starts out by saying that he has nothing against Mike Vapes, and that he won't let the fact that Mike Vapes is a popular reviewer influence his review. He was basically saying that because Mike's is a, such a beloved reviewer on YouTube that everyone was giving his RDA undeserved praise. So I've been subscribed to Jay Hayes for a long time now, and it seems pretty clear to me that he's got something against Mike Vapes in this review. He tries to find cons about everything, and even goes as far as to use an infrared temperature sensor on it. 
he really wanted to find something wrong with it. First, Jay complains about the boxes being identical to the Govad box, which is also made by Vandy Vapes. He also complains about the Vandy Vape logo being on both the Govad and the Icon. Now, I'm not sure why this is a con. Both are made by Vandy Vape, and it's common for a manufacturer to use similar packaging and put their logos on all of their products. Then Jay points out that the box says that the Icon is innovative, implying that the box and logo show that it's not innovative. Now, I think that's really nitpicky and has nothing to do with the review. Then Jay mentions that the RDA gets extremely hot. He used an infrared temperature gun and tested it after vaping on it and found that it reaches 107 degrees. At first glance you might think, wow that's kind of hot, but if you take a second to think about it, that's not really hot at all. I've been using this myself a lot and it has never gotten so hot on me that it causes discomfort. Now I don't have an infrared temperature sensor, although I kind of want one now. Uh, I think that's a, a pretty neat non-scientific test of how hot an RDA might get with constant use. But anyway, I did a little test of my own to see how hot 170 degrees is. So I got some hot water from my water machine, which comes out at around 160 to 180 degrees or so. I put a thermometer in the water until it reached 110 degrees, and I let it sit until it got to 110. So I first tested with my finger, and it felt just a little bit warm, not hot at all. And then I put the water to my lips and let it sit on my lips. It's much warmer on sensitive lips than it is on my finger, but it's still not extremely hot. Definitely not hot enough to feel like it's burning. Then I decided to chain vape the Icon at 100 watts, hotter than what Jay tested it at and I put my lips right to the metal of the RDA. I even put my lips on the air holes right after vaping and it still didn't burn my lips. It felt cooler than the water did. Now I'm not trying to say that the Icon doesn't get hotter than other RDAs because it, it probably does. Jay isn't wrong about that but he's exaggerating his argument that the Icon gets too hot. Now I actually like some of Jay's review. He pointed out that he pointed out some legitimate cons that I haven't seen other reviewers mention but ones that I've noticed myself for example, he said that the deck look almost identical to the Peerless, except without the walls and the posts. That's true. It's nearly the same. Nothing wrong with that in my opinion. The icon improved on a good design, I think. Jay also mentioned that it's hard to pull off the top cap and that the e-juice comes out of the airflow holes when you turn the top cap. Now, I totally agree with that too and, and something I was going to mention in my own review. But then he mentions that the flavor is extremely muted. Now, I don't think he's being honest here. The flavor that I get from the Icon is really good, and I'm only using a basic space dual coil build. No Claptons or twist, twisted wire or anything like that. Now, I don't think the flavor is as good as something like the Goon, but it's not far off. To say that the flavor is extremely muted is not being honest. Either that, or he had something wrong with his build or the way he wicked it. Now, in the end, he said that it's worth $30, but he wouldn't buy it, and then he gives it a rating of 6 out of 10. Now, that's not the end of it. Jay actually decided to do another video testing the temperature of various RDAs, one of them obviously being the Icon. He decided to do this after getting flack for saying 107 degrees is extremely hot. But based on my own use of the RDA and the water test that I did, 107 degrees is not hot. Hotter than other RDAs maybe, but hot enough to hurt your lips, not even close. All right, the next topic, an Austrian toxicologist says that vaping's bad reputation is a public health scandal. So an article on one of Austria's biggest news sites, uh, steiermark.orf.at, was an interview with a toxicologist and professor at the University of Graz, Dr. Bernard Michael Mayer. From what I understand, Bernard Michael Mayer is a vapor himself and a well-known advocate in Austria. This publication got Mayer's thoughts on electronic cigarettes and health. Basically, Mayer called the bad reputation that electronic cigarettes have a health policy scandal and that they are much less harmful to health than anti-vaping groups make them out to be. He explains that vapor is a mist of aerosol, simil similar to that of asthma inhalers. Uh, this aerosol eliminates the entire combustion process that causes harm from tobacco smoke. Mayer points out that nicotine has a bad reputation because it's associated with smoking, but when you isolate the nicotine from smoking, it's relatively harmless. He compares it to caffeine. He also explains that there are already reputable studies that show that when smokers switch entirely to vaping, the toxic substances in their blood return to the same levels as that of a non-smoker with only a few weeks. Mayer also talks about his thoughts on how politics play a big part in the bad reputation that electronic cigarettes have. The pharmaceutical industry makes a lot of money from their quit smoking drugs and nicotine replacement products. They fight pretty hard to make vaping look bad so that they can continue making money. And then you have the loss in taxes that governments make from tobacco. This massive amount of lost ta tax money causes governments worldwide to put vaping in a bad light. It pretty much all comes down to money. Now this isn't really anything that we haven't heard before, but it's great to see a respected doctor, toxicologist, and professor explain to a major news publication why vaping isn't bad. Okay, moving on. Charlie Noble releases their recipe for Commodore Perry. So Charlie Noble continues making DIYers and their loyal fans happy by releasing yet another recipe from their discontinued product line. This time their flavor called Commodore Perry. The last time they released a recipe, they received a lot of requests for this one. Commodore Perry was 
was already on their list to eventually release, but due to the amounts of requests that they received, they decided to move this one up to the front of the line. The inspiration from this recipe came to uh, Matt Topolsky, the head of R&D at Charlie Noble. After he visited a Latin market and saw a can of pear nectar, he bought some cans of pear nectar and a few pears and got to work on creating the flavor in e-liquid form. The end result wasn't pear nectar, but rather a creamy pear flavor. So here's the recipe. Pear from per Perfumer's Apprentice at 6.5%, Bavarian Cream from Flavor West at 3.5%, French Vanilla V2 from Capella at 1.5%, Coconut from Capella at 1%, and Caramel Candy from Flavor West at 0.5%. Now like the previous recipes, Matt also goes in depth on why he chose the flavors that he did, and this is great insight into the mind of a master mixologist. I'll go into a few interesting highlights. So he says that the Perfumer's Apprentice makes a nearly true pear flavor, and that the percentage is high, but is balanced out with creams. Flavor West's Bavarian cream works as the cream base and gives a dense mouthfeel. It tastes great and isn't overly sweet. Capella's Vanilla Custard V2 fills out the rest of the cream flavor. It's a gold standard for custards. Capella's French Vanilla V2 works well with pear. It gives the accent needed to make all of the flavors pop. Capella's coconut is a little trick that mostly only seasoned veterans use. Just a tiny bit will make a dairy-related flavor taste more realistic. You just don't want to add so much that you can actually taste the coconut. And Flavor West's caramel candy simply adds some more accents. It's a strong flavor, and you want to complement the flavors with it, not overtake them. So there you go. It, it's cool to glean little tips like this from DIY experts like Matt. Um, I like how he explains how he uses just small amounts of flavor to accent and round out flavors while not using enough to detect it. And that tip about using Capella's coconut is really cool. That's definitely going on my shopping list. All right, the next topic here, Duncan Hunter's bill to say vaping is introduced and listed as HR 2194. All right, now I just want to give a quick update on the, the Cigarette Smoking Reduction and Electronic Vapor Alternatives Act proposed by Duncan Hunter. Now, I, dus I discussed this in depth last week in episode 66 of the vlog. So if you want to learn more about it, just go check out that video. But basically, this is a new bill that would define electronic cigarettes as a non-tobacco product in the in the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act. This would allow vaping products to have regulations that differ from the current tobacco regulations. It would also highlight the harm reduction benefits that vaping has over combustible tobacco. Anyway, the bill was introduced into legislature on Thursday, last week on April 27th, and it now has a bill number. If you go to congress.gov, you'll find it listed as HR 2194. This bill looks pretty good to me, but whether or not this bill gets the support that it needs is another question. All right, moving on. Here's a summary of the vaping documentary, A Billion Lives. Now, as you may or may not know by now, the long awaited vaping documentary, A Billion Lives has finally been released. I had the chance to watch it this weekend and I wanted to give you a quick summary on that. So they start out by talking about how smoking started, where it started, um, how it became popular, and then about how studies in the 60s eventually discovered what that smoking was actually dangerous to our health. I've seen a lot of people complaining about this section of the video taking up the first 30 minutes of the movie. I actually thought, it was interesting, but I also think it's fairly common knowledge and probably probably didn't need to be 30 minutes long. The next section of the movie got into the invention of the electronic cigarette and how it all started. Han Lick created the first e-cig in 2001 and released it to the public in 2004. There were very few people using e-cigs from that time until around 2007. And then in 2007, eCigaretteForum.com was launched and gave the small vape community a place to talk and discuss the hobbyist side of vaping. Over time, small e-juice manufacturers started selling better flavored e-juice and different types of devices could be more easily found. Then the documentary goes into some of the legal roadblocks that the vape industry saw as a result of its growing popularity. The FDA started seizing vapor products around 2010, claiming that they were drug delivery devices. Uh, the vaping manufacturer Enjoy sued the FDA and won. From that point on, vaping has had a bad reputation with media and health organizations making claims that vaping might be toxic and unhealthy. Now this is where the director of A Billion Lives, Aaron Biebert's journey starts in the documentary. Now, it's worth pointing out that Aaron is not a smoker or a vapor. He interviewed many health experts who believe that vaping is a life-saving invention. And then he goes into the politics of the vaping war. Uh, so there are two groups who are fighting to make vaping look bad. Competitors and people who believe vaping is morally wrong. Electronic cigarettes have become major competitors to both big tobacco and the pharmaceutical industry. These are billion-dollar industries that want cigarettes or e-cigarettes to disappear. It makes sense that these industries would fight the e-cig industry, but why would health experts fight against vaping? The CDC, the AHA, and other major health organizations simply didn't know how to deal with this totally new product that came out of nowhere. It looks like smoking and still has nicotine, so these organizations just couldn't get over that fact. They wouldn't look at the evidence that vaping or even the use of nicotine is not actually dangerous. There are many other pro-vaping studies mentioned here that show how little risks there are with vaping and, and using nicotine when it's removed from smoking. Then A Billion Lives, it goes into the politics involved with 
big health organizations involvement in the anti-vaping movement they point out that these anti-tobacco organizations actually have a lot to lose for example the american cancer society has their logo right on the box of nicorette and other nrt products these organizations are financed by pharmaceutical companies in the forms of grants and other contracts. Dr. Ricardo Pelosa, who was the founder and director of the Center for Tobacco Research, actually stated that if the electronic cigarette replaced smoking, his anti-tobacco organization would be out of business in just a few years. Then they started talking about how the vaping industry has struggled to fight back against its poor reputation because most vaping advocates are unorganized and that the loudest voices are cloud chasers who are seen as obnoxious. But Aaron points out that while these people are the loudest voices in the industry, they aren't the majority of vapors as a whole. Uh, most vapors, they just want to quit smoking. They aren't hobbyists. They aren't cloud chasers. Many of these people have tried various government-approved products to try to quit and were unsuccessful, and they finally found a method that works in the form of an electronic cigarette. In the last 15 minutes of the documentary, they discuss the anti-vaping research. So they talk about the infamous formaldehyde study in 2015, which was actually found to have been a fraud due to the researchers testing the devices at temperatures that were so hot that they were burning the wicks. So why do these studies keep happening? Well, it's because these researchers are mostly funded by the government, which is actually illegal. The CDC, for example, has used taxpayer money to fund anti-vaping research in the form of grants. They've even been warned for doing this, but it continues to happen. So research teams, they take this money, they get the results that these organizations want so that they continue to be funded again in the future. The documentary closes out with serious concerns that people have with the vaping industry slowly being regulated out of existence around the world. For example, Australia has banned nicotine-containing e-juice, Poland is enacting legislation legislation, and the FDA has estimated that more than 98% of vaping products will be banned due to their legislation. And many other countries are doing the same, all without looking or choosing to ignore the evidence that vaping can help save lives. So that's about it. I think that's probably a fairly in-depth summary of the documentary, but there's a lot more to see, so I definitely re recommend watching it yourself. Now, I've seen comments around the web complaining that, th that the documentary didn't provide an opposing view of vaping, uh, but they actually did try to get comments from the Centers for Disease Control, the FDA, American Cancer Society, American American Heart Association, the American Lung Association, and even what the well-known vaping opponent, Dr. Stanton Glantz, and all of them declined to comment. So anyway, I went into this expecting that I was going to dislike the documentary. Um, I thought it was going to be overly biased, but I don't think it was. It's, it's certainly biased to some degree, but you know, that's to be expected of most documentaries. Their goal was to show the benefits of vaping, the, corru the corruption of anti-tobacco movement, and they did just that. The biggest problem that I found with the film is that it didn't have any sort of call to action for the viewer. All throughout the documentary, they portrayed the dangers that the industry is facing, but they never really explained what someone could do to stop it. I also don't think that the seriousness of the situation was displayed strongly enough. I get the feeling that someone outside of the vaping community would watch this and then not feel urged to do anything about it. The film made it seem as if there's practically nothing anyone could do to save vaping. But I do think that they did a decent job of convincing a smoker that vaping is a much safer alternative to smoking and a method that might help them kick the habit for good. So I do recommend giving this a watch. I enjoyed it. And I would also suggest that you show it to anyone you know who smokes or to non-smokers who that you know who think that vaping is dangerous. You can buy a digital copy for $10, or you can rent it for about 3 to $4. Just go to abillionlives.com and you'll find links on, on where you can buy and rent it. All right, and finally, I want to share with you a poem about vaping. I saw a thread on ecigaretteforum.com from a user named noobgens007 who wrote a poem about vaping. I just thought it would be fun to, to share, so it goes like this. I've been vaping my way into your heart. Cigarettes are dumb. Vaping is smart. You're still on the stinkies? I fall in sometimes. Stinkies give you wrinkles, fill you with tar. Now I can finally walk up the stairs without feeling dizzy. I can go anywhere. Why all the controversy, laws and regulation? I hope there are places for vapors in heaven. Okay, so that's all I have for this week. You'll find the show notes for this episode on vapepassion.com. Just do a search for episode 67. If you want to support the show, consider donating to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash vapepassion. You can follow me on Twitter at vapepassion, and I'm also on Facebook if you want to leave me a comment. If you like this weekly show, please consider giving me a thumbs up on the video and subscribe to my channel if you're not already a subscriber. You can also subscribe to the podcast version of the show on either iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. If you'd like to get notifications of new reviews or of the show, you can sign up to receive my weekly email on vapepassion.com. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email me anytime at alex at vapepassion.com. All right, I'll see you next week.